yeah, I felt like I don't know. I just wanted to share my story since you guys were the ones that kind of helped me become Polly because it was really through listening like to all the other stories and like laughing through them and like crying through a few of them that it was like okay there's there's a lot of different ways to do this because I think in my mind going in there was only like one or two ways to do non-monogamy and now it's like there's infinite. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 171. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a wonderful interview with Pearl. She is in her early 30s, kind of new to Polly, new-ish, I'd say, and has a beautiful story. Yeah, it's a it's it's really fascinating and she's really done so much growing and figuring out who she is in the last couple of years through this journey. And so yeah. I, I hope I we hope, I suppose Emma hopes as well, that you enjoy this and we enjoyed talking. So thank you, Pearl, for for coming on and sharing your story. Before we jump into her interview, we do have a couple of quick announcements. First up is our next virtual meet and greet is Thursday, March 18th. It's a Thursday night uh, at 6 p.m. Pacific or 9 p.m. Eastern. We would love to have you join us. If you haven't joined a meet and greet before, they are events, virtual events where we all get gathered in a Zoom room. We do some icebreakers. You go, you are in put in then breakout rooms and have a talking point to meet other people. You're then shuffle the rooms and you get to keep meeting other people. I did sounds a really like, bad job. Like, it sounds like you're just figuring out what these are on the go. <laughs> I did a really bad job explaining that, <laughs> but you have to trust me that they're there's super so much fun. fun. Yeah. Yes, there's so much fun. If, if the last like, one we had over 40 people. If you're looking for a way to meet other people in the community um, and just maybe you're brand new to this and it's intimidating, this is a really great way to just get out there have a fun evening. It's 10 bucks um, and they last about two hours and we just, we have a great time with them and and we've gotten really great feedback and we love doing them. So we hope hope to see you next Thursday. Yeah. If you want to sign up, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the meet and greet tab. These are open to anyone. And as Finn said, they're $10. So come join us. It's going to be awesome. And you want to do the next, the next part of this <laughs> I'm going to let you take over for a second. <laughs> well, now the pressure is on because I made fun of you. If I screw this up. <laughs> I know. So the other thing we wanted to just say was a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. We're not going to dive in too much what Patreon is, but uh, it is a platform for supporting content creators. And we have a community of about 155 awesome people that come together and do um, virtual Q&As and men's group and women's group and uh, there's an online MeWe community that we like. It's a chat group. So anyway, thank you to all of you for that. A couple of dates for those um, events. So we have the next Q&A coming up on March 24th and the next men's group on March 23rd. And there will be uh, the women's group just happened last week. So that w- next one will be in April. And uh, we just wanted to maybe throw a quick um addendum on there about the men's and women's group. We are in works of rebranding those so they're not so binary and exclusive. They are open and welcoming to anybody and everybody. Um, Please reach out to us. We've had non-binary people join before and have sent us messages saying that they feel welcome. So thank you again to everybody for being an awesome, welcoming community. And I think that's really it other than wanting to, uh uh-oh, Emma's got something. She's I have one point, other she's thing. Pointing. In this episode, uh, cl- uh, Pearl mentions Dan and GGG, and we want to just clarify real quick that she's referring to Dan Savage, who hosts the Savage Lovecast podcast, and GGG means good giving and game. And if you want to know more about what that is, just Google it. Yes. So that'd be the fourth G. Yes, Google. <laughs> and if you would like to give us any feedback, um, get in touch with us, send us a voicemail, whatever, please reach out. If you go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the contact us page, you can do send us an email or send us a voicemail. We love to hear from you. We love feedback. We love if you'd love to come on the show and share your story. Just let us know. Just let us know. And also all that Patreon stuff we were talking about. Sorry, if you are interested in joining that and if you're looking for a community, 
Um, you go ahead and check out our website again and click on the Patreon button and you'll see all of the information there on how to join. And we would love to have you check it out and be a part of the community. And with that, let's go talk to Pearl. Welcome, Pearl, to the show. We're so excited to have you here. I know you reached out a little while ago and we're uh, excited to make it happen. So thank you for being here. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me here. I'm kind of excited to be on a show I've been listening about for like probably the last two years now. So thank awesome. you. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for listening for all these years. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you've seen the progression of us <laughs> getting, getting better. slightly better and better. Oh, each absolutely. Time. <laughs> yeah. so, well, thank you for finally, you finally were like, they have gotten good enough at this that I'm willing to come on. <laughs> That might have been my decision making process a little bit. Who knows? Yeah, All good, right, perfect. Good. Like, I'm not, they're not up to my standards yet. So, well, <laughs> th- thank you uh, again for being here. And do you mind introducing yourself, uh, really, to us and and to the listeners? Yeah, for sure. Um, so my name is Pearl, and I'm in my early 30s, and I live on the west coast in Canada, and um, I'm newish to poly. I would say, like within the last, I would say two years. Yeah. Pretty much when I started listening to your show, um, decided to give it a try. And so now here I am to tell a little bit about my journey, I guess. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Well, you're about to talk. Well, I was, okay. <laughs> was going to talk and then I saw you were about to say you something. Go, you go. I don't want to get any hate mail. For talking <laughs> over you. I was Do you ever get hate mail? <laughs> no, no, not too often. Usually just me. <laughs> Everyone loves Emma. <laughs> It's because I'm so sweet. Yeah. Um, What I was going to say is that, so you've been poly for about two years, but I'm curious, like backing up a ways, like growing up and early on in your life, did you have any, uh, I guess, different relationship structures modeled for you throughout throughout your life? Or was it mostly like in the last few years, you're just learning about this all? No, it's, I grew up, um, in a fairly religious household. Um, we were Christian and, it was like thumped home to us that like, you do not have premarital sex, you know, um, you get married, you have kids and end of life basically. And it was kind of, that was, that was what I was told or knew as like love was like until death do us part, you know, even if it's not like super functioning. And I kind of saw that in my own parents' relationship growing up, like they, they loved each other. They have a really good, like companionate marriage, but like they're, I wouldn't say that they're like in love and they'd have like quibbles and stuff like that. And I don't know, I just, I guess once I started having my own relationships and once I moved out of the house and stuff like that, I started to realize like, "Mm, I don't want that. (laughs) Mm-hmm. If that's what marriage is, like, I don't want it. Um, and kind of shrugged that off. And I don't know, I guess was still looking for the one when I was dating. Um, but, uh, not, nobody kind of was right. It seemed like, um, until my most recent partner, um, I, th- I actually thought he was the one, like when we met, I was just getting out of a long-term relationship. It was a seven year relationship. It was my longest one. And we were very monogamous and I was very like unsexually satisfied. And, um, yeah, I was just looking for freedom, I guess. And I found my partner, um, six weeks after I had broken up with my seven year relationship. So it was really fast afterwards. And, and he, when he met me said he knew on our first date, he was like, I'm, that's going to be my girlfriend. Like, that's that's the one. <laughs> he told me this afterwards, and I remember laughing about it and just being like, "Wow, that was that's really weird," because um, I've never felt that way. Like it took me a little bit longer to kind of feel like, "Okay, this this is the guy." And um, I actually ended up proposing to him on our one year anniversary at a music festival, and he said yes, and we were super excited about it. Um, and it was right around that time, that one year anniversary, um, the honeymoon phase when he started to bring up that he felt like he, um, could be poly or had been poly in his past and kind of floated it by me. And, um, I don't know. Yeah. I kind of, it, it was a real struggle at first to, there was a lot of, um, feelings coming from a monogamous background. Like, am I not enough? And, you know, all of those things that come up and 
yeah, we really struggled through, through coming out, um, not coming out, but like coming to terms with this new idea. Um, we had a lot of discussions and the way that he proposed it as well, wasn't exactly, I would say the most honest or ethical way to go about opening a relationship. Um, he knew that I had been bi curious, but had never really done anything with that due to like my religious upbringing. And he kind of encouraged me to possibly go on a date with a woman and kind of explore that a little bit. And I kind of liked the sound of that and was like, okay, and got really excited about it. And then he kind of threw out, well, if you're going to date women, then like I should be able to as well. And I, yeah, it took me, it took me back. I'm, you know, trying to be like GGG as Dan would say, like good giving and gain. I was like, okay, yeah, that seems fair. (laughs) Even though I was like now trying to struggle with like my sexuality and like a new style of relationship. It was, it was a lot all at once. So. Yeah. It was sort of that he wanted to do this and this was for him the, the, an easy way to talk, an easy way to talk you sort of talk you into it. Um, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we did, I tried, I went on, um, I got Tinder and I started swiping and I matched with a few different people and I went on a couple of dates with a woman, but like just never really felt the spark. Um, even though I was like really excited and I really just wanted to kiss her (laughs) just to (laughs) see what that was like. Uh, I just knew that it wasn't right. And I knew that she'd been like hurt in the past. So I just didn't want to lead her on. So I kind of had to call that off. And then my partner had started dating, um, as well. And he reached out to a friend of his that he'd always had a crush on and kind of started to explore something with her. And she, I guess, happened to mention that she was also by curious and kind of thought like that I was cute. And so then of course my partner tells me that and he's all excited. And so uh, he's like, well, like, what do you think about a threesome? And (laughs) it's like, all of this progressed like really fast. Um, so (laughs) I don't know. I, I was just like, okay, like, let's just all in, like, let's just try everything. Let's just do everything. And at the same time, while we were exploring this and it was really exciting, I knew that like, I didn't have the emotional tools to be dealing with a lot of stuff that was coming up. And Mm -hmm. so I bought more than two and like burnt through that in like a couple of days and then just kind of sat there for like a week after just trying to process everything. Cause there was just a lot in there. Um, and so we started dating this friend of uh, this friend of his, and we had a couple of threesomes that were a lot of fun, but ultimately it just didn't work out. Um, it's a, it's a hard thing to get a three-way connection. And I think oh, I've yeah. heard that a lot of time on your, on your show. Well, yeah. So. And also like you were sort of, you know, they had a history and you didn't really have that history. I'm sure that didn't help make it easier. It wasn't like you two randomly found some woman. um, Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't evenly balanced either. So like, I wasn't seeing anybody at the time because I was like, I'm just going to explore this, this, this person with my partner. Um, But like they would go on dates and stuff, uh, like overnight dates and stuff. And I would hear things from like, other friends. And I was like, Oh, it started to get kind of weird because it was like, we weren't really out, but like we were trying things and people were kind of noticing. So he was going on separate dates with her and your, your sort of exposure was confined to threesome. You know, it was both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so how, I guess, how did that progress? And, And you, when you reached out to us, you sort of, the way you described it is poly under duress. Uh, mm-hmm. another Dan yeah. Savage mm-hmm. um, yeah. and I, th- I think that seems fitting mm-hmm. um, like you but it wasn't I guess it, it wasn't like you were in the it wasn't really an ultimatum of like we need to be non-monogamous or I'm leaving you um, it was just sort those of words, an, like were, those ahead. words were never used but I kind of felt them if that okay. makes sense in a way because he just he he said it to me in a way like this is something I've always felt I've needed in other relationships. Like he would kind of be monogamish behind his partner's backs. Like he would still, um, exchange nudes with other people while he was dating someone or like, you know, have flirty conversations over text with them. So 
he was kind of being unethical behind their back. And I guess kind of felt really bad about that and wanted to just come out and be clean about it, which I really appreciated the honesty. Um, especially because there was a bit of an incident early on in our relationship where we had just moved in together. I think it was like nine months. It was almost a year. I think we were together, maybe something around there. And he wanted to go out to the club with a friend and a woman. And, uh, I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I have, I have no qualms about like insecurities around jealousy or stuff like that. And I was just like, I wouldn't want to go to the club. So I was totally fine to stay home and just work on some art. And, uh, but I was like, you go, you have fun. And I even dropped him off at her house. And, and it's cool. Cause the club that night, they had a live stream of like the club. So even though I was at home, I could like watch and just like dance along with music and like it was awesome it was a good time and yeah they were great and then after the club closed I didn't hear anything from him and I was like messaging him like hey do you need a ride and and then finally I got a phone call from him and he was just so wasted which should have been the first clue he didn't even know where he was he was sitting on a sidewalk somewhere he's just like come and find me so I'm driving around and I find him um, and then I take him home and we're talking and he's, this is, he's passed out in bed, like eyes closed, but he's still talking to me is how, how drunk he is. And I'm like asking him like, Oh, like, did you have a good time? Like, and he's like, yeah, I had a good time. And, um, he, he kind of was acting, he, I don't know. He was just like, he wasn't quite in his mind and the things he was saying was like, Oh yeah. Like she was really cute and stuff. And I'm like, okay, well like, that's nice. I knew you probably liked her. And, um, anyways, the next day when he's sober, something I said tripped his memory. And all of a sudden he remembered that he had like kissed her at the doorway when they had said good night. And he told me this three days later that his dilemma wasn't it, his dilemma was basically whether he should tell me or not if this happened. And I wasn't like, I wasn't mad when I heard that they had kissed. I was like, I understand like that feeling. Like sometimes you just want to see where something goes or you feel a spark or whatever. But the fact that he didn't want to, he wondered if he should even tell me was what I was really mad about. And, um, right. Yeah. So I guess there had been kind of red flags along the way that, I'm kind of starting to see now that I'm out of this relationship, but yeah. And this was like, now you said this was about two years ago. Cause you, you had proposed to him a year after meeting him and then you had then gone down. down, yeah, gone down the non-monogamy train. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's funny because all of my fears that I had in the beginning, um, they kind of turned out to be reverse. Like I was, I was worried. I was like, you know, this is Pandora's box. Like once we open this, <laughs> non-monogamy box there's no going back and things like that but it turned out to be the exact opposite like I didn't want to go back in the box <laughs> and he did <laughs> yeah and that, and that was something else you talked about in your when you messaged yeah. us and I think maybe yeah taking us into the next steps of the the sort of imbalanced threesome how did things mm -hmm. progress from the from there so it um I had this preconceived notion that in order to have sex with someone that you need to be in a relationship with them, which I think is something that a lot of people feel as well coming from the mono world and like religious background, it kind of makes it a little more okay. Um, so I was instantly kind of just forced us into like this triad and was like, everything needs to be the same. And I, she just obviously, I think was looking to explore and all of a sudden was like then pushed into a relationship with like two other people and it just didn't feel right. So we had a conversation and we just like ended things like amicably, like there's, we're all still friends. But then from there, I kind of hopped back on Tinder and started swiping through people again and came across a guy and we had great chemistry and my boyfriend was pissed because <laughs> that wasn't the deal. The deal was I date women, not men. So he, in, he was trying to be like GGG as well. So he was like, okay, well, like, I guess I could maybe be okay with this. Like, we'll just take it slow and I'll see how I feel. And he just always kept throwing up roadblocks. Like whenever we wanted to hang out, it was like, oh, why is it a weekend? Or like, why does it have to be this day? Or, or you can hang out, but you can only hang out in like public or like, you know, just all these things. Anyways, even though as sweet as this guy was, it didn't go anywhere because his dog uh, got put down, I think like on our like third date or something like that. And he was just a wreck, like as anybody would be. Um, so mm -hmm. he kind of just dropped off the face of the earth. And 
So then I started swiping again and landed on um, this beautiful woman and she messaged me right away and we got talking and just like, again, had really great chemistry. And she, I mentioned in my profile that I did burlesque dancing. And so she was like, Oh, like, that's really cool. Like I've always wanted to see a show. And I was like, well, I actually we're putting on a show in like six weeks here. And she's like, I'm coming. And I was like, Whoa, okay. Like that's, that's pretty cool. It's like a long ways away. And I forgot to mention too, that when we matched, she was in my hometown and then she drove to her hometown, which is like seven hours away. <laughs> I see. So it was like, Oh, the next shit. town over in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The next town over. <laughs> No, I'm a little more um, central than that, but yeah, we're pretty <laughs> smart out up here. Um, so we chatted for weeks and then she told me she booked her ticket or she bought her ticket, booked her flight, everything. And then the morning of my show, she messages me. She's like, my flight's been canceled. There's too much snow. And I was like, oh, damn it. And then she's like, I'm in my truck and I'm driving. <laughs> And I was like, holy shit. Cause she would have had to like leave really early to make this like show. And anyway, she drove like a mad woman and got into town and we met up for lunch and it was just like all smiles and just so much fun. And she came and watched the show and that was great. Um, and I had to do a show two nights in a row. And so the first night, um, I just like after the show went home, which I would have loved to spend more time with her, but it was kind of a, my boyfriend was like, even though it was a woman still, he was still struggling with this. Um, cause he had not been making any connections at this point with anybody. So, and, and he wasn't part of the connection with her. No, he wasn't. No, we, we decided right. to date separately at this point. Okay. Um, so then the second show, the second night I had the show, um, is when she came and watched and it was just such a fun time. And then after the show ended, she's like, what is there to do around here? And I was like, well, <laughs> we are kind of a small town. There's not much to do other than like the clubs, but I'm like, there's only, the only other thing is like the strippers. <laughs> 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 And, uh, and I was like, and I can't, I can't say how they are. Cause I've never been. And she's like, okay, well that, that's it. That's it. We have to go now. So yeah, we went to the strippers after and yeah, it was just a really good time. Um, yeah, I don't know. And so then she went home and we had this like year long, long distance relationship that like we would call and like talk and text like every day. Um, and we only actually saw each other about four times over that whole year. It was mostly just talk and text, but she was like a big part of my life and filled like a really big emotional need, um, that I didn't realize that I had. So yeah, it was pretty cool. So that, so that was sort of your first go at mm-hmm. really at, at, a, at a polyamorous mm-hmm. relationship. I mean, totally. not to, not that was like to right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. I have a logistical question before yes. we go on into your story. And I have never been to a Canadian strip club. Emma has, but uh, <laughs> I, when, I have. And I don't know why I didn't just ask her. But when you're when you're tipping the dancers, because you, your one and your one dollar and two dollars are coins, do you, do you have to go all the way to a five? Basically, yeah. Um, the like, I, from what I've heard in like college, my my roommates grew up in Thunder Bay, so it sounds a little seedier over there. Um, <laughs> they said they would like have competitions to try to stick coins to the strippers. Like the strippers would like let themselves down and they would like throw coins to see if they could get them to stick to them. (laughs) Um, but no, this, this, when I was hanging out with her, she was like my sugar mama, basically she was flashing fives and twenties and buying shots and yeah. All right. It was real nice. (laughs) Now we we know. Noted. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So, so you have the relationship with this woman and then, yeah, I guess again, how how do things progress? Because we we kind of know a little bit, you know, and then yeah. I know a little bit where things go, but maybe maybe fill yeah. in everybody else. So um, so after the show, we kept chatting. Um, I went. I think she came here again. She came here twice, and then I went down there twice. Um, the first time was in the summer, and then the second time was in the winter. And, um, it just, it just wasn't working for, um, either of us anymore. Um, the relationship just wasn't serving us. She had kids that needed her. Um, she was also trying to date on her end in her town and that was taking up time. And 
I don't know. It, we, it was, I wish I would have had known before I went out to visit her. I drove down to spend Valentine's day with her and it was also like her birthday weekend. So I drove seven hours there, spent one night. Um, and it was kind of, it's weird because she had kids. So it was like, and she wasn't out to them. So I was like, well, I'll just be like Auntie Pearl and like, I'll just sleep on the sofa. And, um, but it was just something happened. And all of a sudden we had this conversation. It was like, I don't feel the same way or like this just isn't working anymore. And it was kind of a shock after I'd like spent all the time and money to get there. And so then the next day, basically I packed up and drove home <laughs> um, and like called my boyfriend and was like, you know, crying. Actually, it was really, it was kind of a funny story. Um, the, where she lives is fairly close to the U S border, like in Washington and, or is it Oregon? He's Oregon Washington. first. Washington. Yep. Washington. Okay. Um, yeah. So I started, I'm like crying my eyes out and I'm driving down the highway and I must have missed a turn off because all of a sudden I see this like huge overhead like bar with like signage, US, Canada. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, like, oh my God, I'm at a I'm at a border somewhere. Like I've made a wrong turn. And so I just kind of like pulled over and just pretend like tried not to panic. Cause I didn't want like anyone to like come running out and be like, why are you turning around? <laughs> and then basically turned around and ran. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so along this, so the, during this time was, how were things between you and your, your boyfriend? Like, in yeah, cause you were like, in that relationship for a year. Yeah, it was hard. Um, he, it was always awkward too. when like she, the second time she came out, cause I was like, Oh, just stay with us. And then it was like, well, where does she stay? Like we have a second room, but then do I stay in the second room? Or like, it was just, I don't know. He, and they, but they butted heads badly. Like we all went out to the club one night and, um, I can't, this guy was like, getting flirty and like touchy feely with her. And I guess he didn't like that. Cause he's like assuming like, you know, she didn't welcome that. Like there was no consent there and like tried to go over and say something. Um, cause I was sitting with her and he was, the guy was trying to be like a little touchy with me too, but I kind of like, I dealt with it. And anyway, so he said something to her and then she was unhappy about that. And then it was like, then it got really weird. Cause then I'm in between both of them and he's feeling like he's owed an apology. He wants her to apologize. And I'm like, I can't ask her to apologize for you. Like this isn't my place. And it got harder after that because he just didn't like her. Um, obviously. And so I would try to like share happy things that like we would talk about over text with him and he would just kind of like shrug it off. And he still hadn't been dating anybody like the whole time that year that we were together, he didn't date anybody. Like, I think he tried, he had Tinder. I know. Cause I saw him swiping through people. Um, Oh, actually that's a lie. He did. He did match with somebody, but they were never good matches. Like the person he matched with was coming from like, um, uh, very controlling, um, marriage and it just, yeah, not good matches. So, so you were, so he, so it's that kind of that classic, he wants yeah. to open the relationship. You agree with it kind of out of duress. And then the momentum kind of shifts. Exactly. Yeah. I just had way more success at it. Um, and I, I could tell what it was like. It's just his, attitude and demeanor. Like he, he's a good looking guy. He could have lots of dates, but he just wasn't putting out the right energy, um, and effort and it just wasn't ever returning. So anyway, yeah. um, so he was pretty happy when that relationship ended. Um, he was still trying at this point. So he had matched with someone who told him about an open, uh, an open relationship meetup. And I was like, well, I'm, I was still dating, uh, this, this woman at the time. And I was like, okay, well, I'll come along with you just to support you. And so we went to this meetup and it was after hours at this, um, game, game kind of pub place where they have like board games and we walk in and everyone's already seated. There's this one big long table and there's probably like 30 people and they're already seated. So it's really intimidating walking in. And it was like, Oh shit, like we're already late. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> and so we sat down where there was like only the two seats left and it was like the other end of the table. And it was like an older crowd, but it got really weird because there was like a young crowd and an old crowd. And the old crowd was like the old swingers. And the young crowd was like the new felt like poly people who were just kind of interested to like meet people and get to hear people's stories. Whereas the swingers were like, okay, we're here to fuck. Like, <laughs> is this happening or not? <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I kind of tried to just like excuse myself from that group without, cause like you can't really change seats. We're all sitting at like a bench. And so I was like, Oh, does anybody want to play a game? And kind of walked over to like another table and then kind of like a bunch of the younger people kind of came with us cause they had the same weird vibes. And so we started playing this game and then this guy walks in late and sits down next to me. And I turn and look at him I'm like, wow, this guy is really good looking. And like, I could just feel his energy. It was just really amazing and warm and great. So we started playing this game and we're flirting. And I think my boyfriend can see this because he's sitting on the other side of me. But anyways, he gets up to get a drink. And then I, I was like, this is my opportunity. So I turned to this guy and I was like, Hey, did you want to maybe like connect on Facebook or something like that? I think that's what I said. Cause I was like, everybody's got Facebook. So we exchanged names and um, kept in contact through messenger. And he was uh, brand new to Polly as well. He was just interested in kind of seeing what it was all about. And um, he wasn't with anybody. So we messaged each other and I told him like, Oh, Hey, I'm not really looking for anything right now. Like, I think you're really great though. I was like, I I have a girlfriend. Um, I'm actually going to see her this weekend. And that was the weekend that we broke up. Um, so then I come back from this weekend and I messaged him and I'm like, well, it didn't go as planned. Uh, instead we broke up. So I was like, I'm going to need a few weeks here to kind of collect myself, but then I'd love to maybe go on a date or something. And he was like, yeah, sure. No problem. And so we went out to coffee and it was great. And I think this was, this was right at the beginning. No, it was like the middle to end of February. And, um, we had a great coffee date and we kind of kept in contact after that. And I was like, I just really want to see this guy again. And of course now I'm like, well, I have to talk to my boyfriend again because here we go again, like another guy. Um, and so I talked to him and he was like a little more okay with it. Um, cause I guess he'd had time to kind of adjust the poly thing with me and my girlfriend. Um, but he's like, it's still a switch for me to be okay with you dating another guy. So there were still kind of issues there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, and thank you for, for kind of filling us in. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite the, I mean, I feel like you packed a lot into like, <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a terrible job of like laying out this timeline and like what's happened, but well, it's kind of been all over the place. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I mean, basically, so roughly about three years ago, you met or you mm-hmm. you met the your boyfriend at the time. You proposed yeah. to him a year after, and then you opened up your relationship. Mm-hmm. You got into you tried a threesome first, and like or the the not just a threesome, but a, the three way relationship. Tried that for a little bit, and then mm-hmm. you tried you met the other woman and you dated her for a while. And meanwhile, your boyfriend was swiping through Tinder, but not really matching with anybody. And then yep. you started meeting these guys and kind of going down that road a little bit. And this is the Emma's cliff. Yeah. These are, this is my Emma's cliff yeah. version. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> and so that leads us to like next or last spring, I guess, like mm-hmm. almost a year ago, not quite a year ago. Yeah. So this was kind of right before lockdown as well. Um, cause we started dating end of February. Um, this, my secondary partner and I, and I even remember in the beginning, there was like, I think I had like a throat tickle or something, or I just felt like a head cold or I don't know. I had a headache and I was like, I feel weird. And I was like, I probably shouldn't see you. And so we went like, I think it had already been a week since we'd seen each other, but I was like, now it has to be two weeks. So it was like three weeks before we saw each other again. And when you're like in like the throes of NRE, like that mm-hmm. relationship energy, it feels like a lifetime. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was hard, but I think it was really, really necessary for me because he was just such a bright energy. Um, and being around my boyfriend at the time was just not, he was, constantly draining me, um, just feeling like a dark cloud and was just getting kind of depressed and, um, going through his own stuff. So it was like, I got recharged every week and that was the deal. We had some rules surrounding my relationship with this secondary partner. And one of them was like, we could only see each other like once a week. Um, and then we had a bunch of other rules like surrounding sex and safety and things like that. But basically it was like, yeah, allowed to see him once a week. So I started doing that every week. I would just feel so recharged when I saw him on our date day. And then I'd go back home to my boyfriend and just like, uh, just slog through it basically until the next time I saw my secondary partner and would just like be rejuvenated again. And 
Um, I think it was my therapist who started to point it out to me and was like, you know, she, at first she was trying to be like accommodating, um, and just like, maybe could you spend more time with your secondary partner than you like with your primary to try to even things out a little. And, and I was like, no, there's not really room for that. And so I tried some other compromises, but she was the one that, um, kept asking me the questions. I guess I didn't want to ask myself about my relationship. Cause I was kind of distracted by the secondary one, just like living for that instead of, I mean, I was still working on my primary one, but it was just, it was a tough balance. Um, especially when you, when one is so great, that's all you want to do. You just don't want to be in the other one. Right. That right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's, and that's hard, you know, just like thinking back to the, you know, one year into your relationship, you, you propose to this guy and not that the person who proposes has to like, you're forever doomed to be with that person. But like you at some point were like, super enamored and and enough to propose mm-hmm. to this person and now you're sort of coming down off of that while ramping up another yeah yeah it just started to fall apart um and it wasn't until my because we we had said that like we'll we'll wait to make it a, like an official announcement we did tell our family um our immediate family and a few friends that we were engaged but we are like, we're going to wait until he gets a ring and he proposes and then we'll make it official and make an announcement. Um, but it wasn't until a year and a half had gone by since I proposed to him and he still hadn't asked. And I was like, okay, well, we should probably check back in here and see what's going on. And it was my younger sister who got engaged at Christmas that made me kind of think like, oh yeah, like where are we with this? And so I started asking him questions and Um, and he just basically said that because our relationship had been so kind of tumultuous through this whole opening up and poly thing, even though we were still fairly happy together at that point, um, he's like, of course I wouldn't want to propose. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So yeah, I don't know. And that was a year ago, Christmas, right? Like, so that Mm -hmm. was, yeah. Last Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and And so then you met, the guy at the game night started dating him and it sounds like that started to really expose maybe some, some cracks. Mm-hmm. In the it did for sure. That ultimate, that, yeah. That ultimately led yeah. to the end of that relationship. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it was just all these rules started to like kind of get in the way. And, and even though I would try to be accommodating, like I, I think one of our dates was like a Saturday night and then he was like, Oh, are like all your dates going to be Saturday night? Like that's like the best night. And I'm like, okay, well I'll pick a weekday next time. So we did a weekday date and he was still unhappy with that, but it's like, we weren't even doing anything on Saturday night anyways. So like, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> just trying to get all the best parts of me in my time, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Or, or, still unpacking keep, or this. keep them from somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's really hard. And, and, you know, not to demonize him cause it's a very hard, it's Thanks. hard. It's hard to go through mm-hmm. to, to watch your partner. And I'm sure he was seeing you come back happier than you, when you left. And that's a, that's a difficult yeah. thing. I remember there were a few moments oh, and I, this is the part that my therapist was really unhappy about is that I was starting to stifle my happiness when I was around my boyfriend. Like I'd come back from a date and I would just be feeling like so happy and glowy and I'd be like washing the dishes and I'd be sitting there with like a smile on my face because I'm like replaying the highlight reel. And then he's like, what are you thinking about? And I'm like, oh, nothing. And then of course he knows that's a lie. And so then I would just um, I'd be like, Oh, I was just thinking about that time when we like were on this trip or whatever. And I like start to like lie about it. And it was like, why am I lying about like why I'm happy? I should just be able to be happy. And I think that was the ultimate killer for him is that he couldn't find the compersion. And that was something that I found pretty early on. Um, when we had, we're having that threesome is like, I just took so much joy and seeing like how happy he was like pleasing this other woman or just like thinking about her or whatever. Like it, it, um, yeah, I've never really been super jealous, so it was easier for me to get there, I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, so when the, that relationship ended with your f- fiance, mm-hmm. how, like, how does your relationship, I'm stealing on this question, <laughs> how, how does your relationship sort of look today or your, like, 
What do things look like today? I don't know if there is still a relationship that you are currently in. And and I guess how long ago did you two split? So we um, broke up at... On Halloween, basically, it was pretty shitty. Um, we were part of a group costume, and he decided the night before, like, yeah, I'm just going to stay home. And I'm like, well, what about our costume? Like, we need you as part of the thing. He's like, yeah, well, just like whatever. <laughs> and so that was like, okay, that's a, that's a, that's 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 a shitty thing to do. Like, I don't know. Um, so that was the last straw, I guess. We had a conversation after that, where I said, like, you know. I've been feeling this way for like a year. Like I've been trying really hard and like, I just don't know what to do. And he's like, well, right now, like I'm ready to throw in the towel. And that was the first time I had heard him voice that he was really unhappy in the relationship. And I was like, okay, well maybe we should sit down and talk about this. And we did. And, um, the way the conversation went was basically that he felt like I was not doing enough he said, you're doing a really terrible job of balancing me, um, your other partner, your friends and your new career. And I'm like, well, I'm, you're literally getting the best parts of me. And if that's not good enough, then that's all that I can do. So I guess that's it. And it was just the weirdest way to end a relationship. I guess it was just this realization of actually not being enough or being enough for what he wanted. Right. And, um, so we broke up and, um, it's been, what are we now? We're in January. So it's been two and a half months. Is that right? November, December, January. Yeah. So we lived yeah. together for, we lived together for the final month of November and then moved out December 1st. Um, and so we've been separated for now about six weeks actually. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's pretty recent, but, um, I'm still with my secondary partner. Um, it, we're coming up on our one year anniversary um, in February, which is crazy to me. Um, it's, yeah, it's been a, that's been a change with this mono to poly thing is having different anniversaries that like overlap other relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, right? <you're> them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's a tough thing to go through. So thank you, you know, for reaching out and for wanting to share that with us. Cause that's not easy to, I mean, it's not easy to go through and it's definitely not easy to relive. So thank no, you. No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I felt like, I don't know. I just wanted to share my story since you guys were the ones that kind of helped me become Polly because it was really through listening like to all the other stories and like laughing through them and like crying through a few of them that it was like, okay, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Cause I think in my mind going in, there was only like one or two ways to do non-monogamy. And now it's like, there's infinite, Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it sounds like, I mean, so many people, you know, when, when a relationship ends, so many people point to the non-monogamy as, oh, that, that has to be the reason mm. that your relationship ended. And it sounds like, well, non-monogamy definitely played a role. There were other mm-hmm. factors too. Yeah. But you know all, there always you. are. There always, yeah. Yeah. I'm thankful though, because I honestly wouldn't have met my, like now, I guess, primary partner if I hadn't been with my boyfriend at the time, I wouldn't have gone to that meetup. Like I've met so many amazing people through him and it's really changed my way of thinking. I honestly don't know if I would have tried Polly on my own, um, if he hadn't really pushed for it. So I have a lot to thank him for, even though it didn't work out. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that was sort of one of the questions I was maybe going to ask was like, what are some of the things that you learned about yourself? Cause it sounds like in the, in that, that time, that you were exploring this, you know, with him, that, that you grew a lot. Um, yeah. you, you had a lot of experiences. I think that was part of the problem. I think I, I outgrew him. Um, we grew together for a long time and I think the poly journey kind of put us on our own little growth journeys. And, um, I felt myself growing a lot and I didn't really see much on his end. And, um, I think that was, that was part of it. Um, but I learned a lot. I learned, that I can be happy for somebody else. Um, and I've learned that through my friends as well, like being happy when someone get, else gets a promotion or someone gets married or, you know, this, that, and the other, there's lots of ways to apply compersion in a mono world, um, as well. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. Totally. And even in a, mono- in a monogamous relationship, right. right. Mm-hmm. Watching, you know, your partner get the promotion or your partner have opportunities and, and not having to compete or compare against those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Where do you see yourself going in the future as far as do you think you'll continue to try to seek out other partners uh, or, and you don't have to know the f- answer for sure. I'm just curious yes, kind of where, where you're at now. <laughs> <laughs> well, where I'm at right now is my secondary partner, although he's amazing and I love him and I would like love to spend more time with him and him for be to be the one he um has another partner who's more of a companionate partner they have a business together and things like that they live together they're kind of like husband and wife so i don't really want to come in between that so it's kind of put me on this journey of like still wanting to have um like a primary partner like a live-in partner in my life so facebook uh, knew that I was recently single and decided to throw this Facebook dating <laughs> shortcut at me when I was at one of my lowest. <laughs> and, <laughs> have your, they, they, Zuckerberg has your best interests at heart. I know. Right. So I'm like, what's this? I click on it. I'm like, Oh, Facebook dating. And so I start flipping through there and, um, I've gone on a couple of dates with people from there. Um, it's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> been very interesting, especially too, because they're most of these people are coming from a mono background and they're looking for like you know someone to have kids with. And I don't want kids, and I don't know if I want to get married. But so it's been kind of interesting. I don't think it's the right dating pool for me to be in, but I've met some interesting people. Um, I've also opened myself up to um, some friend interests. I've had a few friends in my circle for years that I'm like, oh, they're really cute, like. I wonder if there's anything there and gone on a couple of dates with them and been like, Nope, we're just friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, at least you could explore that and see. Exactly. Exactly. And that was one thing that I wouldn't have never happened because those two people I went on dates with were also people that my partner was really insecure about and like told me about it. Like, Oh, I would have a problem if you ever wanted to date this person. So yeah, yeah. being single, I got to explore that and it just wasn't right. So moving on. Um, but I am kind of, I've been on a couple of dates with this one guy from the Facebook app. Um, he's coming from monogamous background too. So it's, I've been taking it really slow and just kind of like asking him questions. Cause I don't want to get, you know, cowboyed away. I'm like, there's no way anybody's getting to take me away from my like primary partner right now. Cause he's just so amazing. And I know we're not supposed to compare, but it's really hard. Um, that yeah, it, he, for someone to, surpass like him would be I don't know it would be hard to find do you see it do you see it changing your view like when you go on dates now like do you see your standards being higher because you like you you do have a you have a boyfriend right or you have a partner yeah Yeah. and so like you aren't sort of and not the not to say that you were ever in desperation mode but like you aren't going out like well I need a boyfriend or I need a girlfriend. Like I, yeah. Like, yeah. I kind of have all, yeah, I've got all my like needs met and stuff like mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, it's, I haven't really felt the pressure. Like, yeah, I need to go out and I need to find someone. And actually it's just recently that I got rid of the app. Um, because I'm just like, you know what? I'm spending way too much time on here. Like I already spend too much time on Facebook and now I'm on this Facebook dating thing. Like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> So I'm like, okay, time to focus on career. So I've kind of put that aside. Um, and I've had some really interesting talks with my, with my boyfriend. Um, he, I told him that I started dating, which he didn't really know and was like interested in and was like, Oh, well, is there something that like, I'm not giving you that you're, you're needing or you're wanting. And so it's really opened up the door for us. And we've had some deeper conversations because I think I got used to, um, our relationship just always being one way because it kind of had a ceiling on it because of my other partner that I was dating. Um, like my primary partner at the time, like, you know, we couldn't live together because I was living with him and like, we couldn't, it was a glass ceiling. Like there was only so far we could go in our relationship. And now that I'm single, it's like, I forgot that. And I'm still living in this like small box. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like one day he messaged me and was like, Hey, like, are you free Sunday? Do you want to hang out? And I was like, Sunday's not our date day. And I was like, Oh yeah, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> like, <laughs> sure, I'm coming over. <laughs> um, so it, it was an interesting though for him to go to the play when you said you were starting to date for mm. him to, to basically think that you were only doing it because he wasn't fulfilling or there was something he should be doing more. Like I, I just find that interesting, right? That, mm-hmm. that he sort of took that, even though you had met in a non-monogamous capacity, mm-hmm. 
that he that the, that his mind still went there like oh well i must not be doing enough if she needs another partner yeah well i think it's just it's like it, it's almost like um default setting yeah, like yeah. when i broke up with my girlfriend i think my boyfriend at the time was like relieved because he was like oh good we're going back to mono like we're just gonna it's gonna be us again and then all of a sudden wham i like met my secondary partner and he's like oh shit and same thing with uh, my boyfriend now. Like, I think he was just like, oh, well, she broke up with her primary. So like, now it's just going to be us. And then all of a sudden was like, oh, she's dating. <laughs> so it's like almost people think when you break up, like you just default to being back to mono. But it's like, just because I'm not with another person doesn't mean I'm not poly. Yeah. Right. Which is sort of the question that I was coming to next is like, do you see yourself continuing to explore non-monogamy or or have or do you have this sort of desire to go back to a monogamous dynamic at some point um i think hmm i think right now i i'm kind of still exploring poly i still see it being in my life even in more of like a monogamish way like if i do find like my live-in partner um, I could see us living more of a monogamous lifestyle um, with maybe like some monogamish around the edges. Like I do kind of want that one person to commit to, but at the same time, I just don't know if it's realistic. So I'm trying to just kind of keep myself open and flexible to kind of whatever happens. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's, you know, it's, it's an interesting approach or well, not. It's, it's not an interesting approach. It's, I like that you say that because I think a lot of times when people from the from the outside world, the monogamous world, hear people talking about non-monogamy or polyamory, that they assume that like your goal is to have seven different boyfriends and try to balance them all equally, um, or seven different partners, right? And mm-hmm. and it sounds like your sort of ideal would be to have a primary partner, and you you know you're not looking to necessarily do like relationship anarchy or, or non-hierarchical mm-hmm. like you you sort of want that that rock or that foundation and then from there to have other opportunities and experiences yeah absolutely um yeah i think like i don't know what the future really looks like either like i don't know if i actually want i say i want it but i don't know if i want it if i want to live in partner or not like it's a really hard thing to do and in mm-hmm. all of my long-term relationships it just kind of the magic just fizzles away and it becomes everyday mundane. So it's like, even though I would love to live with my secondary partner, my primary partner now, I don't know that that would be the best thing for us. Like I'm, I'm like, I think part of the magic is that I only see him like a couple times a week. Yeah. I was going to say, do, do you notice a difference, like the spark and energy that you two have versus what you and your, your ex partner even though mm-hmm. i guess at, at roughly this time in that relationship you were proposing so it seems like maybe there was still some fire and, and energy at that point yeah like the it was really good up, uh, basically up until we opened the relationship and then all these emotions just came right. pouring out of everywhere um but <laughs> it's i'm not uh what was your question <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it was really I, I kind of answered it myself. I, was gonna say, I think it was it was around the um around the level of excitement and spark and desire that you feel for, oh, yeah, for, yeah, your, yeah. for your, oh. your current partner at one year versus your, yeah. your ex partner. So and I think that's part of the thing is like when um you see your partner every day, you kind of have less to talk about, especially if you talk throughout the day over text. So the conversations you have are very like surface level where when you see someone a couple times a week, you've got lots to talk about. Um, Mm -hmm. and you're like genuinely excited to see that person. Like I remember reading this door knocker when I was like, it was like a, from like Claire's, like an accessory store. And it said, how can I miss you if you won't leave? It was like some teenage sassy, like, you know, whatever, but it stuck with me all these years. And it's like, you know, you really do need some space in order to like miss people. Yeah, exactly. To have something to talk about. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if every day, and I think, you know, th- this is something that I know we've heard from people that COVID has really been a difficult strain on relationships you know married relationships or, or partner mm-hmm. relationships that 
that for years and years and years had flourished because, you know, every day you and your partner walk out the door and get in your cars and go to work and don't see each other for eight or 10 hours. And then you have yep. something to talk about at the end mm-hmm. of the day. And if, if you're sitting five feet from each other or in the same house all day, every day, like all of that mystery and excitement is sort of mm-hmm. just gone. Yeah. yeah. So instead of like getting maybe like nudes throughout the day, you just get to see your partner in their underwear and like bathrobe, like covered in snacks all the time. <laughs> it's not quite as sexy. <laughs> Like I, I, it was funny. I lost my job in, um, middle end of March, I guess, um, because of Corona and my partner went on stress leave. So we were together 24 seven for like four months every day we saw each other. And I think I asked him, I was like, what is, I'm like, what do you, and it was at the end of a relationship. And I was like, what do you, what's the outfit you remember me wearing the most? And he was like, your bathrobe. And I was like, cool, cool. Yeah. I think, uh, it was just your underwear. I think I just remember you in your underwear all the time. Like, uh, (laughs) Well, the the trick there, the trick there is to get sexy underwear. We are we are implementing this trick currently. Oh, we are. <laughs> that would spice things up for sure. So it was interesting in contrast to see I was spending 24 hours with one partner and then I was seeing my other partner like once a week and it felt a lot better having that space. And so it's kind of something I had hoped would happen at the end of our relationship um, with my ex and I is that maybe with being separated, we would be able to rekindle something, but Ah, alas, he is going through his own stuff. So it seems pretty, pretty done. Yeah. So that was another interesting thing that I never really considered with, um, mono is like when you break up, you break up, there's no changing the relationship. Whereas with Polly, it seems a little more fluid. Like you can change the relationship to suit you kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could change from a primary to a more second. If you're like doing the hierarchy thing, you can change that Mm -hmm. and, um, like, or why like, not, why can't we go from like living together to not living together? Why is it only one way? You can only live right. with them. And not. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right. totally. Totally. Right. Um, I was curious. So like how out in your life are you about being poly and about having multiple partners? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question because I had been struggling with this for a long time. I felt like I was keeping a secret from my parents. I told my siblings because they're all pretty open about it. Um, And I just felt like there was something, I just wanted a closer relationship with my parents. And I was like, this has kind of become a big part of my life. Like when I was with my girlfriend for almost a year, like right before I went to go see her, the last time before we broke up, I was really contemplating, like, I really want to tell my mom about her. Like, she's so amazing. And like, she's been such a big part of my life. I really want to tell her. And then we broke up and I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad I didn't tell her. (laughs) And then fast forward to, um, I think, when did I tell her in the fall? I think I told my mom, I was like, yeah, I got, there's something I want to tell you. And it's my boyfriend and I have been exploring an open relationship for the last two years and it's all good. And I'm seeing this other person like who you can meet or not meet if you want. Like I can tell you what doesn't matter. I just, this is a part of me I wanted to share with you. And I got a really kind of disappointing response. Um, It was not the response I was looking for. It was just like, well, if you're happy, I guess. And she just kind of shrugged and it was like, oh, okay. (laughs) I mean, it was nice that it was no big deal. There wasn't like a a big stink about it. But at the same time, it was kind of just didn't, it fell flat. Um, So anyways, she says, well, as long as you're happy. And I think it was middle of October when I told her or something like that. And then two weeks later, my boyfriend and I broke up and I was like, God damn it. Like, why does it happen this way? (laughs) Oh yeah. So anyway, she did end up meeting, um, my secondary partner who's like my primary now. Um, because we wanted to hang out for new year's Eve because we can't go anywhere because of Corona. So his partner, his partner at home was home. So he's like, I'm like, well, there's only, uh, if you want to meet my parents, I'm hanging out with them. <laughs> so it was great. He came over and we had a good time. And, but it's weird. Like my parents still kind of like, don't really want to acknowledge him. I think because it's just so soon after my, what seems soon after my other relationship, but has been actually going on the whole time. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't they know how they're brain know. wrapping it. Yeah. 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 That is an interesting thing to think about, right? Like for you, it's not new, but for them it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't yeah. even think of that. Yeah. 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 So. Hmm. 
the, the, the problems the problems that arise in polyamory and monogamy <laughs> that we don't even realize are strange until we're like, oh yeah. damn, that is a little weird. Yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you listen to the show, you kind of know a little bit about how this all goes. Is there I well, maybe you came prepared with a blooper? If not, <laughs> we can we can ask some other questions but we wanted to give you the opportunity of course we we almost robbed somebody of their blooper once and they got a little i know they got a little bad (laughs) (laughs) um i was thinking about this all day today and i was like i just i could not come up with anything i think the biggest blooper or blunder was just like having that guy's dog pass away (laughs) just like (laughs) It really was like just shitty timing. That was probably yeah. the worst. Yeah, yeah, I laugh, but that is that is really horrible to well, have. Yeah, happen. and I mean, like that would be my luck, right? Like you meet somebody who's amazing, and then this yeah. tragic thing happens, and you're like, um, yeah, just yeah. great chemistry, and like, yeah, they just don't have the emotional, yeah, to be there. So yeah, yeah, and it's not like you can get mad at them. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. So it's just like I just kind of send yeah. love and support from afar, but like. A lot of these relationships were, um, really hard on me, um, because I found that I am, uh, what do they call it? Empathic, like super sensitive towards people's energies. That's why I talk about energy a lot. Um, because it's, it does really affect me and it's, it's also been my biggest guiding force. Like if someone's got great energy, I'm just like, follow that. (laughs) I want more of that. Follow that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That yeah. makes that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. Um, I guess before we wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to share, or do you have any other questions? No, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, anything that you you haven't. I mean, you've shared some, like I, you know, we uh, we tend to ask a lot of questions, but you've really like woven in so many of the lessons and things you learned throughout. Yeah, throughout your story. So I mean, thank you for that, and and sorry about yeah, asking yeah. you questions and answering them uh, <laughs> for you. <laughs> I felt like I got a bit rambly at times, but um, oh yeah, well, and then it rubbed off on me. So it is a, I'll blame you. For it is that. a podcast; you're supposed to talk, <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, are there are there any other thoughts or things that you wanted to share before we let you? Um, um I think my my other biggest um, saying that I've kind of carried with me that served me as well that might serve other people is just the grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. Um, you know, I think that's something that people from a monogamous background tend to think like that are in unhappy relationships is, Oh, it's just so much better. If I was single, if I was on the other side of that fence, you know, there's all these amazing people out there. And while that may be true for some relationships, um, I do believe that the, the best ones are whether you put the work in. Um, so you just need a partner who's going to put in the same amount of work is all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm going to ask kind of an asshole question just because I feel like we're, we're close enough now after this, (laughs) after these 58 minutes, do you feel that the part, that part of your relationship with your fiance not working out was due to a lack of you watering it? Or do you, you, you touched on it earlier that it was a lot about growth and you both growing and maybe you growing at a different speed. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to maybe, I just, I heard somebody asking that like theoretically, like as they, as they heard you say that, well, maybe you didn't water your relationship with your fiance enough. Mm. Yeah, no, I truly believe I watered that one. I probably maybe even overwatered it. (laughs) Got a little, (laughs) little swampy. (laughs) Got a little swampy. Um, there were some uh, mildewy parts, but yeah. uh, no, I think I put in, I put in the work. I just wasn't seeing that back from him. Um, I, I threw myself into what he wanted, which was a poly relationship and threw myself into it, fully researched everything. And I'd be trying to talk to him about things I had learned in through podcasts or from books and like, you really need to read this because I could see he was like struggling with some emotional stuff and, and he just wouldn't like he, he wanted the relationship, but he didn't want to have to do the work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think it sounds like you, you both needed to water the lawn mm-hmm. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, it, and it was only a one, a one hose situation. Yeah. What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just showing you this just, analogy. Just keep going. I got this just in- keep going. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I, I get I get it. So yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you for answering my question. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well now I'm gonna ask it, is there anything else that you'd like to share? <laughs> Are we <laughs> nope that was basically my last like little little thing yeah. i guess yeah perfect um, no, it's, i'm it's basically a- excited to kind of see where this relationship with my boyfriend goes now um yeah he's kind of said that you know he would be looking for more and so it's kind of just trying to figure out what more looks like for both of us right now yeah 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 that's amazing and i think you know we're, we're excited that you reached out and touch that you shared your story with us and you know i had some difficult parts and so it's not easy to do and again just thank you and we hope to maybe get an update you know in a year and see where it's at yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah totally awesome. yeah well, thank you guys so much for having this podcast like i really can't express how enough like how much it helped actually actually normalize non-monogamy for me so, You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, yeah. Thank you for those kind thank words. You. Thank you. Yeah. And with that, I guess we'll let you get on with the rest of your evening. And uh, thank you again. Yeah, no problem. Take care, guys. And we're back. Thank you so much, Pearl, for reaching out to us and coming on the show. We know it was a vulnerable story to share and had some difficult time, things to talk about, too. So thank you so much for, yeah, just wanting to come on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, one thing that we did want to just maybe bring up, because we know people are starting to get back out in the world and meet people as the vaccines are rolling out and numbers are coming down out there. So we wanted to just mention really quick that uh, one of our favorite services to use is stdcheck.com. It's how we get tested for STIs, and it is super easy and super affordable. They actually just dropped the price like $60, so it's now like $130 to get a full 10-panel STI screening. And it's all you do it online, and then you go to like a walk-in lab, and it's I don't know. We love it. We've used it for years. And if you use the links on our website, it does support the show and you get to save $10. So uh, go use them. it's a win-win for uh, and a win for the people that you're going to go hook up with because then, uh, yeah. then everybody knows what's going on. So take a look at that. We'd love to have you um, use that and support the show, but also hopefully it's a great fit for you. You can find links in the show notes to this episode or in the podcast player show notes as well. And yeah, just thank you in advance for, for your support and I don't have anything else on that. <laughs> no, go check it out. If you want to contact us or join our Patreon or sign up for the meet and greet or just look at all the podcast episodes, there's show notes for each episode on our website. All of it you can find at normalizingnonmonogamy.com. So go check that out. And next week, we have an interview with Sylvie and Jeff. Yes, and we're excited for that. And we will see everybody in a week. And don't forget, there's a meet and greet next week. So go sign up. Get signed up. And it's already actually filling up. It is. I don't know that it can fill up. I was up. like, I don't think there's a fill up. Well, <laughs> it won't fill up, but you can definitely. <laughs> okay. It's filling up. It's filling up. Sure. There's There are people signing up. <laughs> yes, it's awesome. So we'll see everybody next week. And hopefully we'll see you next Thursday. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.